will bring out from the witness the things that are truthful. And you will help the people of this land to be able to reconcile themselves, to be able to have the spirit of patience, to be able to have the spirit, your own spirit of forgiveness, and to be able to allow the processes of the Lord to fix us. You are the Lord that judges all humankind. We call upon you, and we ask that your grace will fall mightily upon the people of this land. And patience and restrain will be the order of the day. This we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Bishop. Before I hand over to the lead council, I want to remind the general public present here that telephones are not allowed in the hall except for the accredited photographers of the TRRC, they know themselves. So no cameras, no mobile phones, no comments, no. Here we treat everybody with dignity and respect, and that is what we want to maintain throughout this process. I thank you for your cooperation. Lead Council. Uh, good morning. Madam Chairperson, Commissioners, and members of the audience, um, may I ask that the witness be ushered into the hearing hall? Thank you. I, Edward Singate, do swear that. Do swear that. I will speak the truth. I will speak the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. So help me God. So help me God. You may be seated, Mr. Singate. Welcome to the TRRC, Mr. Singate. Uh, and uh, thank you for honoring our request to appear before the Commission uh, to assist the Commission in its truth-seeking mandate. Your role here today uh, would be a dual role. You, would, you, you realize, and of course you are aware, that you have been subpoenaed to appear by reason of the fact that you have been adversely mentioned as someone who participated in committing violations of rights uh, during the Jame era. We would also crave your indulgence to assist the Commission in discussing certain facts that would enable the Commission to arrive at the truth as to what happened with regards to those particular incidents, even though you have not been adversely mentioned regarding those incidents. That is just to enable the Commission to establish an impartial historical record of what actually happened. Are you prepared to do that, Mr. Singati? Absolutely. Great. Uh, before we start, I have certain warnings that I need to give you. Uh, you are a lawyer by profession, so you know the drill. Uh, it is an offense under the laws of this country to lie under oath. 
you are aware of that? Answer by indicating yes or no. Yes, sir, I am. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, also, under the uh, laws or the act that establishes the TRRC, it is an offense to provide false information or false testimony to the TRRC. Are you aware of that? Yes, sir. Um, thank you very much. Uh, let me just give you an outline of the issues I would wish us to discuss in your testimony. Uh, you don't necessarily have to write these things down. I would guide you in your testimony and would lead you into the topics as we progress. The first thing we, I would wish us to discuss is your biographical information. We need to know who is this Mr. Edward Singate that is before us. Um, uh, you have an interesting background. We would wish to know who you are, all the, the positions you have held so far and so forth. I know it's a very, very long biographical information, so we would endeavor to summarize and just go through things quickly. Then to the main substance, uh, we want to talk about the planning for the July 22nd coup d'etat. What were the conditions that made the military feel that they needed to carry out a coup d'etat, even though they were all aware that this was an illegal venture? Then we would want to discuss how the coup d'etat was actually carried out. We have heard interesting theories as to what or may not have happened. But principally, we want to know what were the institutional failures that made the coup d'etat possible. <coughs> also, individuals have appeared here and uh, roles or have been attributed to particular individuals. We want to know what is the truth about that. Then, we want to talk about the <coughs> arrest, <coughs> excuse me, the arrests and detention be it lawful or unlawful, of security officers soon after the launch of the coup, the arrest and detention of politicians, including their torture at Mile 2 prison. We would also want to talk about the torture of security detainees. That's what's called the night of torture of 6 September. We would also want to talk about November 11. whether it was a coup or a coup in the planning. We want to talk about the execution of soldiers on the eve of Remembrance Day. We would want to talk about the arrest or unlawful arrest, as it were, of Sana Sabali and Sadi Buhaydara and the fabrication of evidence leading to their incarceration or Sanasabali's incarceration for nine years. We would want to talk about the execution or the assassination of Honorable Usman Korosise, the then Minister of Finance. We would want to talk about the arrest and detention and, of course, torture of uh, civilian who were alleged to have been demonstrating near the American Embassy. And uh, we would also want to talk about the attack on the UDP supporters at Denton Bridge. Uh, it's a long list of issues. Yes, sir, I understand. Um, uh, so we, it is unlikely that we would finish today. Uh, so we would, we would push and uh, <coughs> try to finish tomorrow. So November 11 obviously would take uh, a bit of time. We would want to go through that extensively. So that is the outline of what we would wish to talk about. Are you ready to begin? Yes, sir, I am. Uh, kindly give us your full names, please. My name is Edward David Singati. Date of birth? 8th of August, 1968. Where were you born? United Kingdom. Uh, Mr. Singate, um, 
uh, allow for three seconds okay. between our speeches. Uh, that way our speeches would not overlap. That would also assist the interpreters. Uh, You were born in the United Kingdom. Where in the United Kingdom? Melton Mowbray, Leicestershire. And uh, in which part of the United Kingdom? England, Ireland, Wales? England. Thank you. And where did you go to school? I started school in St. Francis Primary School, United Kingdom, and then I, well, my father relocated back to the Gambia with the whole family and I started at Bacow Primary School uh, in the 70s. From there I proceeded to St. Augustine's High School and after my O-levels I went to the Gambia High School uh, for my advanced levels. Perfect. Uh, I, I, I have looked at your statement and uh, a Mr. Saini Sise was your headmaster at Bacau Primary School. Is that right? That is correct. Wonderful. Good. So, what did you do after you finished A-levels? After my A-levels, I briefly worked for the Gambia Civil Aviation Authority. Um, I started, I um, think, end of 1989, beginning 1990. And should I proceed on my, on my profile, or do you want to yes, intermittently yes. ask? Yes, Let's okay. first establish the profile, and then we delve into the other things. Okay. No, I mean, should I proceed with my own profile? Yes. From yes. here? Yes. Okay. So from uh, 1990 um, to 1991, I worked as an electronic technician at the Gambia Civil Aviation Authority. 1991, January, I joined the Gambia National Army. In May of uh, 1991, I was uh, promoted to an officer cadet. Um, I served as an officer cadet um, until January of 1992, when I was commissioned as a second lieutenant. I was then sent on course to the United States, and on my return sometime in October of 1992, I was made a platoon commander in Alpha Company 1 Battalion. I remained as a platoon commander uh, of the Alpha Company intermittently uh, uh, since the overseas uh, the intelligence team for a very brief time. Uh, but generally I was in that position until July 22nd, 1994. But the uh, platoon commander in the Alpha Company is yes, last company commander prior to the takeover in 1994 uh, was uh, Major Baiji. At what stage, if any, did you work with Captain, then Captain Mama Cham? Captain Mama Cham, um, I was posted to Echo Company as an officer cadet. I was at the training school and uh, to get a little bit of experience in uh, leadership Prior to going to the United States on training, we were sent to Echo Company. We were attached to Echo Company, uh, and uh, the company commander was Mama Cham at the time. Perfect. Uh, could you proceed with your uh, with your with your description of your uh, profile, your biography? Yes, sir. From July 22, 1994 to sometime in February, March 1995, I served as Minister of Defense. After the arrest and detention of uh, Captain Sana Sabali, who was then the Vice Chairman of the Armed Forces Provisional Ruling Council, I became Vice Chairman of the Armed Forces Provisional Ruling Council 
and Minister of Defense. I stayed in that role until um, September of 1996, and after the presidential elections, uh, the president-elect at the time made me vice president-designate. I was vice president-designate until March of 1997, and in the new cabinet, I was made Minister for Presidential Affairs, Fisheries, Natural Resources, Forestry, the Environment, and National Assembly Affairs. I believe I stayed in that role until, until um, March of uh, 2000, sorry, August of 2000. And then I was uh, transferred, or sorry, reassigned uh, to the Ministry of uh, Works, Communications, and Information. But I still retained the Presidential Affairs portfolio along with National Assembly Affairs. Uh, yes, it's, sir. It, it's correct that you continued to hold, to hold ministerial positions until September 2007. Yes, I held various uh, portfolios such as uh, works and infrastructure, uh, trade, industry and employment, uh, forestry and environment until 2007. Yes, sir, that is correct. And uh, then what did you do after 2007? Well, I started studying law at the University of the Gambia uh, September 2006. I finished uh, in uh, 2010. In March of 2011, I uh, joined the judiciary and I was magistrate class one at the uh, Brikama Magistrates Court. In September of 2012, I was posted uh, to Bundung and made acting uh, principal magistrate. I stayed in that role until, I believe, March of 2013 when I left the judiciary and joined private practice. I worked as uh, a legal practitioner, a private legal practitioner at uh, Dandemeyer Chambers until February of 2016. I was appointed uh, vice president of the ECOWAS Commission. Uh, in March of 2016, I stayed in that role until March of 2018. From March 2018 to date, I have been working as a consultant. Thank you. So for 12 out of the 22 years of Yame, you worked with him? Yes, sir. I guess if you calculate it. Yeah. Uh, yes, I, I have calculated it. I, I, I dare say even 13, because uh, 1994, half of 1994 included. Um, so I would take it that you know Yame pretty well in view of this long period of association with him. Is that a question? Or? Yes, it is a question. Well, I know him uh, from a lot of the testimony that I have heard uh, during the course of uh, this commission uh, has led to me believing that perhaps I didn't know him as well as I thought I had, but that is subjective. But we will get into all that. Absolutely. You joined the Gambia National Army in the early 90s. Uh, and um, in 1991, you were an officer cadet. Could you tell us, because you have straddled pretty much both ends, uh, a recruit, a very junior officer, and uh, trainee officer, that is cadet, and then a commissioned officer. At that time, what were the problems in the army? Well, at the beginning, there were not many problems. Uh, I, I dare say uh, the military is a tough place. I believe it was uh, President George W. Bush who said that if you cannot stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. Of course, but uh, I mean, having said that, must the kitchen be necessarily hot? Figure of speech, sir. Proceed, please. Thank you. Um, at the beginning, everything was okay. 
Uh, there were no problems. The military was sizable. It was growing. <coughs> However, um, it, it, it was like a small unit. It was not established as a full, a full army uh, because uh, everything was located either at Yundum or, or, or Farafenya. But this is not uh, one of the problems that, I mean, that we faced. I'm just trying to give a general description. Um, but having said that, um, morale was okay. It was, it was generally high. There was an incident or two uh, regarding the uh, soldiers who had returned from Liberia, who had uh, started a mutiny, and uh, it had got out of hand um, in, in Yundum, I think, uh, soldiers from Charlie Company and then subsequently Delta Company. There were shots fired, but there were no casualties. Uh, problems that soldiers that had served uh, for several years were facing. Uh, but talking, of course, to some of them, they were complaining about uh, arbitrary uh, dismissals. You know, uh, summary justice uh, in the army can be very brutal. Uh, you can be charged for a minor offense, a minor infringement, maybe insubordination. You will be marched to the adjutant, and he can dismiss you. It's, uh, it's uh, his prerogative. Uh, so, yes, definitely there was, uh, uh, there must have been major discontent for them to go to the extent of, uh, of uh, uh, conducting a mutiny. But you are not aware of the sources of the discontent? Uh, like I said, at the time I was very new in the army. Uh, I was still an officer cadet, so um, I, I really didn't know. But how about the conditions of service up to the point? Uh, officers like yourself decided to overthrow the constitutional order. What were the conditions in the army? Okay. Um, I proceeded uh, for training in January of 1992, and I returned, like I have just uh, informed you, uh, sometime in October of the same year. Now, when I arrived, the, the British uh, the British Army training team were just about to hand over to the Nigerian Army Technical Assistance Group, uh, NATAC. There was uh, uh, a lot of uh, confusion. Uh, we didn't know uh, the reasons why that was happening. It, they, they weren't advanced to us. It was a political decision, but which was accepted and um, we just followed orders. Subsequent to that, uh, there was uh, a discontent. Uh, morale started uh, to, uh, to dwindle. There were no recruitments, and um, um, batches that had finished their term were, were leaving, and so uh, uh, the workload increased, um, and they were not, uh, the Nigerians were not recruiting. I'm not sure whether it was a finance issue or whether it was a policy issue, uh, but, but that was, uh, that was uh, 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 a problem. Uh, the same summary dismissals became uh, uh, even worse because, of course, uh, you see, the Nigerian army is a very big army, very regimented. Uh, Gambian culture uh, had seeped into uh, into into our ranks, and so. Uh, what what do you mean by that? Gambian culture has seeped into our ranks. Could you be more specific? 
Okay, I can, uh, but now you are interceding and then cutting my flow. But let me explain that. Uh, please do expect that because it is my responsibility to lead. As you long in as you evidence. take note and then allow me to come back to my trend of explanation, otherwise uh, those who are following it would not uh, fully understand where I was trying to get to. But, uh, I I determine uh, uh, okay. what is relevant uh, for the purposes of the hearing, and therefore. If need be, I would just cut you off Absolutely. politely and make sure that we put it uh, things on, 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 on the right track, at least. Because other, there is so much to say. Otherwise, we would spend a lot of time talking about things that may not necessarily be helpful, uh, at least in our view. So kindly proceed, please. We want to know what were those Gambian cultures that seep into the ranks. Tribalism, for instance. The officer corps was fragmented. You had uh, the Mandinkas, and then you had the few Wolofs. And uh, I would have uh, touched on this a little bit later uh, anyway, uh, because um, this is how uh, or what would explain to you a little bit about Yaya Jame and his position in the officer corps. Because being a Jola and an outsider, he, he, was, uh, he was not uh, I mean, fully accepted. Uh, but I mean, coming back to uh, the exact question, yes, of course, uh, I mean, regional, uh, regional affiliation, but not only that. Um, I, I will give you an example. You see, uh, Sana Sabali was once uh, punished by one of the Nigerian officers for eating on the same plate with a junior soldier, with a soldier, I think, uh, a private soldier or a lance corporal. Now, in our culture, you, you have some food, you're eating, you see somebody, you call them to eat. It's, uh, it's normal. But obviously, uh, in a proper regimented army, there is a limit to uh, how far you can mix. And uh, that's why I said the Gambian culture had sort of seeped into, uh, into the military. And this is one example of the clash of cultures or clash with culture versus uh, regimentation uh, that we had. Even though uh, I must say that um, the punishment uh, I mean, definitely was, uh, was right because in normal armies you cannot... Uh, fraternize uh, with, uh, with junior ranks? Uh, that, is, uh, that, is, that is true. So besides, well, continue with your description of the problems uh, okay. that you experienced at that time. OK, sir, yes. Well, uh, apart from uh, the, the downsizing of the army or the shrinking uh, of the military because of non-recruitment and uh, soldiers leaving, uh, the conditions were also deteriorating as well. Uh, the British at least looked a little bit uh, more, I should not say a little bit, they made sure that whatever was due as far as welfare was concerned was given. Now, uh, under the NATAC, um, especially for, uh, for guards that were on duty and the duty officers, uh, the feeding really, really deteriorated to an extent that we were being given rotten food. Uh, and, uh, yes, sir, you want to? Uh, was that a matter of routine, or was it just some occasional aberration, a situation that just happened out of control of, uh, of those responsible? It was not. Uh, it was not a matter of uh, this thing happening occasionally. It became routine, and it featured in our reports as duty officers. And our reports were rejected, and we were told to go back and then write it properly. Otherwise, we would uh, face the punishment. Uh, how frequent was this? You, you said it was a matter of routine. I would imagine it would happen two, three times a week. Something of this, well, um, put it this way. Um, over the weekends, when most officers, the senior officers, are not 
uh, in the camp, we would eat rotten food. Uh, the reason why I ask this question is that we have received testimony from a number of soldiers who served at the same time with you and uh, who actually participated in the coup with you. Uh, they, of course, they did indicate that uh, the food wasn't the best quality, but this is the first time we have heard evidence of rotting food being served to soldiers as a matter of routine. What do you say to that? Council, there was a day I went on patrol to army headquarters and uh, the food that I was served at Yundum, I touched the fish and it was, it was, it was slimy. No, it was paste, like a paste. Um, I didn't eat it, but by the time I got to army headquarters, uh, there was no soldier there. And I was worried because the gates were open and I thought that perhaps something was happening. Where are the guards? So I stayed there. I didn't have a, a radio. There was no, no means to communicate. I stood on Marina Parade looking left and right and uh, wondering uh, what is going on. Uh, but after a few minutes, I saw a soldier come in from the junction uh, just by uh, Atlantic uh, Hotel. Uh, and he was dragging his AK-47 and uh, coming down the road. So I waited until he came close and I said, what is going on? He said, sir, we are all sick. I said, but what are you doing on the beach? He said, we all have diarrhea and there's no toilets at the army headquarters. So I really didn't uh, know that until that point that there were no toilet facilities or facilities to uh, for soldiers uh, to take care of their personal hygiene at the army headquarters who had uh, to stay there for a week on guard and that all the time they would go one by one to the beach and then defecate at the beach. I only found out because they were all sick and they all had to go to the toilet at the same time and so uh, the army headquarters was left wide open but they were uh, uh, very sick and I, I spent my last money because the, the, uh, the army was low on drugs at the time. Um, uh, the, uh, the clinics uh, definitely had, uh, I mean, had uh, not been stocked as far as I know. Uh, so I spent my last money uh, for them uh, to get medication. But apart from this particular instance, do you recall any other instance? Yes, of course. I recall many incidents where I myself would not eat the food. And uh, if I don't eat the food, if the food is not fit for my consumption, it's not fit for my soldier's consumption. And so I would put it in the report. Uh, so definitely what I have just explained is an extreme case. It only happened once. but. Uh, the food definitely was, 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 uh, was really not fit for consumption, especially, especially over the weekends when the senior officers uh, were not there. It was only the duty officer and the guards on duty. So it was not just water, water, chew, no. but sometimes rotten food. Water, water, chew, we're all used to it. Uh, when you go to the cookhouse, Okay, for officers, we, we, we didn't have that. But remember, I was a recruit and then I was a cadet officer. I used to have my food from the general kitchen. From, uh, and so if the cook sees that the line is still long and uh, there is uh, very little sauce left in the pan, he would order somebody to bring a bucket of water and put it in. But like I said, the military is a tough place and I'm not complaining about that. I ate it because I was hungry. Uh, what other problems did you, or, or, or what were the other difficulties that, so that, that obtained in the army at the time? Yes, uh, like I said, uh, apart from that, there was lack of facilities, uh, lack, of, uh, lack of equipment, uh, the, the infrastructure that was there was, uh, was not maintained or taken care of. Uh, when soldiers had to sleep in the barracks at the time, uh, the sponges uh, were, were, uh, were falling apart, there were bed bugs in the guard room, and really, uh, I mean, conditions, like I said, were, were less than favorable. 
And so it was not difficult to convince uh, soldiers that they deserve and uh, need better. How about uh, the sociopolitical conditions at the time prevailing in the country? Well, the, I was not too much into politics, but uh, I knew that as a country we could do better. That Gambia deserved development, we deserved schools, we deserved hospitals, we deserved uh, better communications. We deserved better infrastructure. And I know a lot of people are going to say that, well, we have heard this song before. But let us transform our, oh, sorry, uh, let us walk down memory lane a little bit. And you know most of uh, those who are above uh, 40, 50 can recall what Gambia was like at the time. The only means of communication through Radio Gambia stopped at Brikama. Could, we couldn't get the signal before that. There was no television station. But even if that was a luxury, there were two hospitals, Bansang Hospital, uh, World Victoria Hospital. The Ahmadiyya Hospital is private. Everything else was private. And people mostly could not afford that. You go to the hospital, there is no drugs, even though that story has uh, definitely continued down the line. There were not enough schools. Uh, so, so, so these were the socio-political well, conditions. Well, can I explain, sir, please? I know we are pressed for time, but uh, yes, I'm on the hot seat and uh, I, I would... It's not hot yet, Mr. Singhati. So, well, so this, uh, uh, the, you know, be, you, 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 you've just said that uh, these are things that are known. So I just want us to put things into context. Uh, if it becomes absolutely necessary, yes, by all means, uh, I'll give you the opportunity to. But we just need to summarize on those points. Otherwise, we would spend the whole day here. I mean, we all do know that there were lots of problems. Uh, I just want you to identify those problems that perhaps led to the coup eventually. Uh, so, but at least in a very summarized way. Okay, sir. Uh, well, you said it's not hot yet. Please, uh, you have got very good staff. Uh, if you can ask them to put some ice in the freezer, uh, so that when it comes hot, becomes hot, they can uh, they can assist. I don't want to catch fire. You wouldn't be needing it. <laughs> okay, sir. I'm I'm grateful. Yes, but uh, I mean, like I said. Um, with regards uh, to the deficit of infrastructure vis-a-vis -vis the, the population at the time growing at 4.5% per annum, uh, we knew that uh, definitely Gambians deserved better. We needed more schools. We needed more hospitals. We needed more roads. roads. We needed everything that every other country had that we felt that Gambians deserved. Uh, and we want to, uh, wanted to give that to them. Uh, yes, but yes, Mr. Singate, yes, at sir. that time, you were aware of your role and responsibility in society as a soldier, were you not? Absolutely, sir. And uh, with all these problems, what did you decide to do? Okay. With all of these problems, we decided to step in and rectify the problems. This is what we had decided to do. Even if it meant losing our lives in the process, the Gambian people were worth it, and so we deserved, they needed better. And if we could, then we would, and we did. But why did you think it was your responsibility to do so? Well, in a compound, everybody has a responsibility. If there's something on the floor that is in the way, if uh, those responsible for cleaning don't pick it up and you pass, you pick it up. You, you, always, you also play your role. We are Gambians and we felt that if nobody else was going to do it, we were going to do it. So you believed at the time 
that as soldiers, it was your responsibility to be a watchdog for the government, to, for the people, on the government. If the government is not performing, it's your responsibility as soldiers to remove that government illegally. We knew it was illegal. Definitely we did. This is why everything that we did was clandestine. We didn't plan in the open. We made sure that we planned in absolute secrecy until we succeeded. So definitely we admit uh, it was unconstitutional, it was treason, and like I said, it was worth it if at all we could build a hospital that will save lives, if at all we could build schools that would educate our people. Uh, what I am trying to drive at here is the mindset of the Gambian soldier. Is it the position of the soldiers in the army at that time that it is their responsibility to overthrow a government that they believe was not performing for the, for the benefit of the people or it was not performing to the expectation of the people? Absolutely not. I would not want to uh, put any blame on any soldier or any officer that was not part and parcel of the coup. They were loyal, they were, they were dedicated, but what we did and what I did, and if you uh, allow me during the explanation of how the coup happened, I will tell you exactly what we did to succeed. We, we used the conditions to subvert them. Uh, so their mindset was not that if the civilians don't do it, then it is their duty. No, that was not the mindset of GNA at the time. But was that your mindset? Was that the mindset of Sana Sabali? Was that the mindset of Yahya Jame? And of course, Saadi Bohaida? Subsequently, yes, there was a meeting of the minds with regards to a, a higher cause, a greater responsibility of what we could do. A greater responsibility by whose standards? Because the people have established a constitutional order and the people who are the higher authority have decided that this is the only means by which we change a government. And you, a group of young officers, you sat there and think it's a higher calling for you to overthrow that arrangement by the people. Council, I'm not arguing with the legality or, or illegality. Or of the morality of it. I, I am not arguing with that. Well, morality, then you're going into a very gray area. Because if we want to talk morality and the law, you know as a lawyer that there's a gray area. And I can very well sit here and argue that yes, of course, if my illegal act has saved the lives of many or improved their lives, then there is a moral justification. So I don't want to I, go I want down, to I don't want to go down that I don't want to go down that gray area. I want you to bring out all the arguments, your reasoning why you did what you did. Because remember, Mr. Singate, uh, that mm -hmm. part of our mandate is to identify some of the reasons why some of these terrible things happened in our society. So if we do not know about this type of thinking in the army, perhaps there can't be re-education of the soldiers to, to, to remedy these things. So that's why I want you to bring it all out. Yes, but um, I, I think you will lose in sight of one very important fact. Soldiers are part and parcel of society. We live in society, our families are integrated. Well, I mean, it's, it's a small society, the Gambia. So uh, the thinking right now, back then, is always that our aspirations have to be met by the government in place. Now, even though, even though there is uh, a constitution and a set of laws that provide for the installation uh, and uh, uh, the, um, I mean, how do I put it, uh, voting in and voting out of governments uh, but still, uh, sometimes 
uh, especially in Africa or in uh, third world countries, if the political process is not bearing dividends, people do tend to take matters into their own hands. Now, please bear with me, let me give you uh, an example. With the Arab Spring launched by civilians, the same thinking, governments are not doing anything, they have perpetuated themselves in power and they are abusing their authorities. But Let us force a change. But the same thing with yeah, Sudan. Singate, yes, sir. This is fundamentally different. Government or power belongs to the people, and the people can't change how they are governed or by whom they are governed any sign they want. Uh, sir, uh, sorry, but sir. But that is, that is different from a group of soldiers taking it upon themselves to overthrow the lawfully constituted order. Is uh, it, is it, don't you see a difference? No, there, there, there is no difference. Remember, uh, according to our laws, civilians are not permitted to change a government any time they want. And I want to underline that any time. They are given the opportunity to do that every five years where they have the mandate to remove a government if, if there is no time frame and laws to protect a government in place, there will be anarchy and chaos. Yeah. You will have a group of people who are not satisfied, they will get up and remove a government, and that cannot, con that, that is why we have laws, uh, sir. Yes, that is why we have laws. But uh, I would want to avoid this debate, this discussion, for obvious reasons. Uh, I don't want this to be seen as a platform wherein ideas are being drummed into people's heads, uh, especially in view of the current political climate. Uh, so let's just put that issue aside, all right? And let's just be content with the fact that power belongs to the people. The soldiers do not have any authority to overthrow a government, no matter how bad that government is. I agree. Perfect. So then let's move on to your planning of uh, July 22nd coup d'etat. You've told us that you were motivated by the terrible or deteriorating conditions in the army. You, you, I mean, the food was very bad, facilities were lacking, uh, equipment was not there, there was deficit in infrastructure and so forth. And there were also problems in the society. So how or what really uh, got you guys to come together and plan a coup d'etat, and how was that done? As Sana Sabali had mentioned, um, because we were very close, we used to talk about a lot of things, and uh, there was general discontentment within the officer corps about the Nigerians. But let me state for the record, uh, I did not have any personal problem with any Nigerian officer. Uh, my battalion commander was uh, was uh, uh, very helpful to me. He was he was very kind to me. However, um, during the discussions uh, with Sana Sabali and uh, the prevailing circumstances, where it was even difficult to get uniforms, uh, a change of uniforms, soldiers were di di difficult for them to get boots, and. Uh, with other conditions too, general conditions, uh, perhaps uh, not coming uh, directly to my head, but coming back to the planning. Uh, we were talking generally about, look, how, 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 how do we change this? I mean, this? This is our army, you know. Should we be commanded uh, forever? Is this right? But the discussions developed uh, further beyond the army to the conditions in the country, and whether we deserved, or our people, the Gambian people, deserved a better life or not. And so, those discussions advanced, and the first real general mutiny occurred, uh, I forgot the month, but it was uh, in 1994, in Kudang, during uh, an exercise called Nindoku, I believe. Um, and because the exercise was not properly planned, 
because the equipment was not there, the conditions, well, of course, I mean, you go to the bush, you don't expect to, to have the conditions of your own house. Uh, but um, there was a lot of discontent. And myself and Sana Sabali started, uh, uh, joined the conversation of officers complaining. And there, there is where we sounded their opinion. And all of their opinion at the time was, yes, the system is, um, is, is, is not a good system, it should go. Uh, was that a mutiny or was it uh, complaints in private by a group of soldiers uh, with one common mind? Well, sir, if you, uh, as a soldier, um, complain to an extent that you agree that a system has to go, I believe if it is not mutiny, they are the seeds of mutiny. Perhaps let's limit it to the seeds of mutiny for okay. now. Okay, uh, that is fine. Uh, so uh, yes, We've sir. received evidence that the exercise in Kudang was a good success. <laughs> um, well, success, in my professional view as an officer, was not a success. Uh, the logistics were not in place, um, command and control was a mess. Uh, I can say this because I was the commander for the opposing force, the enemy forces, and uh, I could see how much in disarray the, uh, the exercise was because the attacks were not properly coordinated. Uh, nothing was properly coordinated. So, for me, the lessons that we learned from Kudang, that at that time, the Gambia National Army was not battle ready, and uh, we needed more exercises, exercises from section level uh, to platoon level, company level, which had not happened for a long time. What do you say to the suggestion that uh, the Nigerian officers were on top of their game, they knew they were, what they were doing, everything went well? I will tell you one thing. The Nigerian officers that came to the Gambia were definitely knowledgeable. They were very good officers. They knew what they were doing. Uh, whether they practiced that all the time, uh, I don't think so. Uh, however, they, they, uh, they were definitely good officers because they have, you see, the Nigerian army uh, is a professional army. And in order to rise uh, through the ranks, you, you really have to be worth your salt. So I cannot fault uh, the, uh, the standards of the officers who came. What was the problem then? Well, like I said, um, the Nigerian pecking order is very harsh very, very harsh. Um, and I will give you an example. Um, uh, the current Minister of Defense, Major Fai, is a very good officer, a good friend of mine. He was embarrassed uh, in, our uh, in our presence on more than one occasion. And for us, uh, senior officers should be treated in a particular way. But uh, there was once he was embarrassed severely by Colonel Okoji and another by Colonel Owonebi. And this, you know, uh, I mean, like I said, the Nigerian pecking order is very harsh and it's, it was difficult for Gambian officers to grasp that. Uh, so from what you have said, there was no <coughs> inefficiency or incompetence on the part of the Nigerian army officers who were deployed to, to, to train or manage the, the, the Gambia National Army at the time? I, I, I would not call it incompetence, obviously. Uh, you can be competent, but then not execute the functions of your duties. What does that mean? I mean, uh, it's either a deliberate effort not to deliver, or one is simply incompetent. So which, which was it? Perhaps, maybe, they were just not interested in delivering. Uh, I don't know what the terms of uh, the agreement bringing them here was, but I can remember being told that 
they were supposed to be here to a certain level, bring the army up to a certain level, and then depart. Uh, but that training you talked about in Kudan yes. uh, was, a, was an exercise organized by the Nigerians, yes. wasn't it? Yes, it was. Was it properly executed? Well, in my view, it was not properly executed, no. And who, who should take responsibility for that? Uh, definitely the commander at the time. Nigeria. Yes. And as a result of that, you were so disgruntled, you thought that the Nigerians should not be leading the army, correct? Well, like that was the general feeling. Okay. So therefore, even though it was not my personal, but generally, yes, in the army, yes, there was that discontent. So, so the issue of the Nigerians, yes. their presence and leadership in the army contributed to really why the group of officers decided that it was crunch time, it's about time we get rid of this government. Is that the case? It did contribute, but it was not the sole contributing factor. That's why we say it did contribute. Yes, but not okay. in a very major significant way that, all, uh, that one could say, no, it's because of the Nigerians. No, it was not. That w uh, the issue of the Nigerians was not the only reason. We've uh, discussed the other reasons. So at Kudang, you said there was a mutiny. Uh, can you tell us who participated in those discussions uh, sowing the seeds of a mutiny? Most of the junior officers at the time. I cannot name all, but the few that I can name which myself and Sana Sabali subsequently brought on board and talked to uh, to be part of the process were Alpha Kinte, Lieutenant Alpha Kinte, and Lieutenant Kante. First name, Lieutenant Kante? It's Alaji Kante. Good. So, kindly tell us about the planning for this school. So, Upon our return from Kudang, myself and Sana Sabali took things further. We approached uh, Alaji Kante and Alpha Kinte separately uh, and talked to them about uh, this idea. And what idea? Taking over the, uh, the government. So, so we, we spoke to, to them about this this uh, whole plot and they bought in. Uh, at this stage, you had a brother who was also in the army, correct? Yes, sir, I did. I did, yes. And he was also an officer like yourself? Absolutely. Did you bring him into the plan? No way, I did not. And why is that? I, you see, um, he I believe would never have bought into it and we might have argued and uh, uh, that would have been it. I, I never informed him at any one time of the plans to take over the government. He was never part of it. Okay, so you discussed with Sana Sabali, Alpha Kinte and Alaji Kante. Yes, sir. And then proceed from that. So when we met, uh, the, we were second lieutenants, all of us. We said, look, we decided that, look, we need somebody a little bit more senior, uh, somebody with a little bit more experience, uh, somebody who will be able to lead, somebody who we have confidence in, somebody who we can rely on. And we collectively chose uh, Lieutenant Baro, Basiru Baro. And we approached him, and he agreed. And so, the original five members of the plot to overthrow the Jawara government were Lieutenant Basiru Baro, Lieutenant Alpha Kinte, Lieutenant uh, Alaji Kante, Lieutenant Sanasabali, and myself. Do you recall? Uh how many months before July 22nd was this plan hatched? Mm, I cannot recall exactly, um, but from the time we left Kudang, I am not sure whether it, it was April or March, 
uh, it must have been after independence. Well, I, I could be wrong, but please go back to the records. I don't want to uh, inadvertently mislead the commission. Uh, but this group of yes. five, yes, the, sir. the membership later changed. Could yes. you tell us about that? Well, uh, we once met um, outside the camp in uh, among some lime trees. There were some lime trees somewhere adjacent to Yundum camp, and we went there and... Uh, Does it have a name? No. Um, it, um, I think there was an agricultural um, uh, installation next door, and we crossed the fence, and then we went. Because we could not talk in the barracks, we had to, to find a way. But uh, we were spotted by uh, military intelligence, and they reported uh, the matter. So, obviously, uh, it's treason, it's treasonous. Um, the stakes are very high. And so, uh, one after the other, they decided to withdraw. Who withdrew? Uh, if I can remember, it must have been, well, I cannot remember between Alaji Kante and Alaji Kinte, uh, sorry, Alpha Kinte, who withdrew first. But I know they uh, were perhaps were the first two in succession uh, to, to leave. And there was three of us, uh, Lieutenant Barrow, myself, and Sana Sabali. Um, so we had no choice but to bring others on board. Three of us, three officers cannot launch a coup like this. I suggested uh, Yae Jame, and uh, the response that I got from Barrow was, uh, was not a good one. Um, Sana Sabali was a little bit tame. Tell, tell us about the response you got from Barrow. What did he say? He told me, Ndoke nyimma fanlong. What does that mean in uh, English? He does, it, he's, uh, well, what is the direct, um, okay, direct translation is that he doesn't know himself, but we know what it means in English that he's arrogant. Um, and um, even though I tried to talk to him, he wouldn't buy it. But I had gone ahead and spoke to Jame anyway, despite uh, Basuru Baro telling me not to. So I had spoke to Jame, and uh, he, he, he came on board. But the funny thing is, um, after telling me that uh, yeah, Jam is arrogant. He told me that he's the type that will tell you that he can hold one LMG here, one LMG there, and then uh, that's... Uh, do, do the Rambo thingy. Exactly, which as professional soldiers is, is, is rubbish. But funnily, uh, um, he, he actually said that, that uh, he can hold an LMG here and, and, then, and then take State House. He did, he did tell me that. So from that point on, you guys knew that he was prone to exaggeration. He was prone to saying things that would not cut the grain. Yes, but you take some things with a pinch of salt or as a joke. Or, or a bag of salt. <laughs> well, a bag of salt is, uh, is a little bit too harsh, you know, between friends and comrades, you know, you, you do have people that exaggerate all the time, but you, you don't take those comments too seriously. But the important thing was he came on board. Why did you think Jame was a good choice, in spite of the protestations of uh, your senior, Basiru Baba? Well, we needed additional officers. Uh, he had served in the Presidential Guard, and perhaps his inside knowledge would help in the planning, in drawing the plans. Or, or was he just a ready-made candidate in view of the fact that he was always against the government? Not at all. Uh, I can explain to you uh, how, I, how I came to be acquainted with Jamme, but it, was, it had nothing to do with politics. I had never discussed politics. In fact, at the time as, uh, of, uh, that I approached him, uh, I approached him because we had already built up uh, a relationship 
and not because of his views. All right, proceed. So now you, you've recruited Jame, so it's yes. now four of, four yes, of you. Sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Basiru Baro, Edward Singate, Sana Sabali, and Yaya Jame. Yes, sir. Then after Jame had come on board, Basiru Baro decided to withdraw. Why? Well, like I said, it had leaked. And tension, I mean, the tension was building. Um, we were being watched by military intelligence. We knew that. Um, all along, um, um, let me also shed light on this second part of it. There was a parallel process also being run. It is not only the recruitment of the officers. Uh, what do you mean by a parallel process being run? Yes, sir, that is what I'm trying to explain. You, you, uh, four or five officers alone cannot take over a government without the buy-in of the soldiers. And so I used my position as platoon commander in Alpha Company, and I was the only platoon commander at the time, so I was basically uh, taking care of uh, all of the three platoons uh, and, uh, under Major Momodu Baji. I was the subaltern, I was a junior officer, so I would act as platoon commander, even though, um, according to um, uh, the military hierarchy, if at all the platoon commander is not there, then the platoon sergeant will stand in for the platoon commander. And I was platoon commander for first platoon, uh, there was uh, the senior sergeant uh, acting for second platoon and so on and so forth for the third platoon. But still, as the, as the officer, I was the one who was giving guidance. And I had developed a relationship with my troops. This relationship was built uh, with confidence. I would make sure that I look after the welfare of my soldiers. Um, I would counsel them, I would uh, be concerned about their welfare and for, for, uh, okay, for example, you have a good soldier who for some reason doesn't turn up for duty. Now rather than uh, charge him uh, with an offense um, uh, for being absent, absent from place of duty, I will counsel him and find out what is happening at home. Essentially, you developed a relationship yes, with, your, with your troops yes. and they trusted you. Yes, absolutely. Okay. And proceed from there. So, uh, what I did was um, I um, slowly got buy-in of a few and then extended it and extended it and extended it until generally I got the buy-in of Alpha Company. And I was the only officer amongst us that was in command of soldiers at the, uh, at the time. Sanasabali was in charge of uh, support weapons. He had no weapons, he had no troops. He, was, he had no office. He was, he was a refugee in the camp. He was just roaming around until he was given a small place somewhere. Uh, so I used that connection, uh, with my connection with, with the troops to get them on board. And that is why I said there was a parallel process so whilst the officers were preparing themselves, I was preparing the troops at the same time. Even though when Sana Sabali was a duty officer, uh, he would talk to the soldiers on duty at the time, uh, but you just cannot stand in front of a parade and tell them, look, we are going to overthrow our government, who is in? No, you cannot do that. You, I mean, there's a way that you have to uh, slowly uh, inculcate your thinking into the troops' thinking and then get their buy-in. So apart from getting Alpha Company soldiers to support mm -hmm. your cause, did you get any other officers? Officers or soldiers? Did you get additional officers? Additional officers, after Basiru uh, withdrew, um, there was three of us again. Myself, um, Sana Sabali, and now uh, Lieutenant Jamme. And we agreed that, look, really, we, we cannot launch a coup with just the three of us. We need officers.
to be in command of the troops to lead them into battle if need be. So um, we decided at that time to recruit uh, Saadi Buhaydra. But uh, excuse me, let me come back. I've, I've forgotten one point when you, when you talk about officers. Yankuba Ture was posted in, uh, to Farafenye. But intermittently, he would come down to Banjo to collect the, soldier, the, the pay for soldiers who were receiving their, their salaries over the pay table. And this was even before Yaya Jame came in. Um, when he was, he passed by Yundum once and uh, I called him aside and I spoke to him. And I told him that this is what is happening. And I know for a fact that if we, whatever we launch from Banjo, well, before I went into that, I got his buy-in once he, uh, once he agreed to be part of it, uh, I told him that, look, his role would be not only to bring soldiers on board from Farafenya, but if he could not do that, was because I know for a fact that if we launch from Banjo, there will, they would be a counter-attack from Farafenya, that he should make sure that he stalls or stops that attack. And that is how Yang Kubature came on board. So he so, was an original member of the group? The original five, uh, like I said, but he was brought on board subsequently, but that was his only role. And because he was not uh, at Yundum or in the combos at the time, he did not play an active role in the takeover of uh, the July 22nd itself. In fact, he came down to Banjo um, a couple of days later because we, uh, we had stopped the ferries from crossing, they could not cross. Uh, but he, he is one of those who originally agreed yes, to he participating was, in the group. Yes, yes. Sir, he so was. now you have four of you. Yes. Proceed. Please. So um, we decided that, well, um, we need somebody else on board, at least one person. And uh, we looked at the possibility of bringing Sadhu Buhaydra on board. But we agreed that we would not give him the full details of the plan. What we would do was tell him that this is going to happen if we are arrested or something happens because it had leaked and, excuse me, it had leaked and uh, there's a possibility that uh, before the day itself we would have been detained, then he should lead the, uh, uh, the troops to come and free us and we continue the takeover from there. So that was uh, Sadi Buhaydar's role. Now, with regards to other officers, I cannot recall whether it was myself and Sana or myself and Yaya Jamme. We decided to sound uh, the opinion of uh, Major Conte, Major Ablai Conte. Major Ablai Conte is a good senior officer, professional. Uh, he knows his stuff, tactically minded. He's a good professional all round officer. So we just um, approached him and spoke to him uh, around the football field in Yundum when we were overlooking a parade. And we didn't tell him exactly what was happening, but we asked him of his opinion about what was prevailing in the country, whether anything better could be done, and what was the possibility of the military uh, stepping in. He agreed that, first of all, that uh, truly the government was not doing well, that they could do much better, that the Gambian people had been left behind and uh, something should be done. But with regards to a military takeover, he said that that would not work. Uh, I think he said in Wolof, so when, once he said that, we backed off because we knew that uh, it's a no-go area, we cannot, we cannot proceed and then tell him exactly what we are uh, what we were doing. How about Durcha? Oh, okay. Excuse me. Yes, Durcha um, was briefly, briefly brought on board, and perhaps that's why, because you know, there's so many activities took place. So if I skip something, 
Uh, it's not because I'm trying to uh, to leave it out. Uh, it's because uh, 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 I'm trying to cram as many details in as short as possible time. Yes, Ndu Cham was brought on board by uh, Jame, I believe. Jame was the one who recommended Ndu Cham. Uh, and briefly he came on board, he attended one or two meetings, and he, w he was always panicking. Uh, um, I'll give you an example. Uh, when we had a meeting in Jame's house, uh, I think, uh, first of all, he came very improperly dressed. And then uh, his T-shirt was inside out. He, when we he was going out, he had his slippers on the wrong feet. He was he was just not himself. Well, with all due respect, uh, I mean to him, but put it this way: planning a coup is not an easy thing. Not everybody can withstand the pressure uh, and the scrutiny uh, because of the implications. So. Uh, so um, therefore, among all those planners, mm -hmm. it was yourself, mm -hmm. Yaya Jame, yes, sir. and Sana Sabali, at least, who were able to really deal with the pressure, who, who did not buckle under all that pressure. <clears throat> well, I would not say that, uh, I would not like, want you to try to separate the wheat from the chaff uh, in that manner. Uh, it was our idea from, from, from inception, uh, we, myself we, we, we know that, Mr. Singate, yes, but sir. you just told us yes. that this is pressure that is difficult to withstand. Not everybody could withstand it. Mm -hmm. Your senior officers, uh, like Nur Cham, for instance, behave irrationally uh, during the planning period. What I want to establish is that the three of you at least were able to withstand that pressure and ultimately carry out the coup. Okay, if you put it that way, yes. Uh, but I, I don't want it to be painted as if um, we were the ones that stood out from the rest. Remember, myself and Sana Saab, it was, it was our conception, it was our plan. We believed in it. Everyone else was brought on board. But the fact <coughs> remains that the three of you were able to withstand the pressure in spite of all the rumors about coup, coup, coup. You were able to withstand that pressure and ultimately you carried on and carried out a coup. Yes, sir. Good. Uh, so what was the initial plan? What were you going to do? What was the first plan? The initial plan was to take State House. This is what I proposed. I was overruled, and they told me that no, we will take the we will uh, uh, arrest the head of state when he arrives at the airport. And I explained to them that look, there will be civilians there. He's coming on a commercial flight. There will be civilians on the plane. Dignitaries come in to meet him. We cannot risk launching something like this that may involve exchange of fire in such a public place. But they told me, no, this is what we will do. Uh, so who, who made that decision? Well, it was generally um, an agreement. Well, I would not say an agreement. This is, this is what they felt. This is what Jame felt. This is what... Uh, Sana felt, uh, who else was there at the meeting? Was it Ndurcham or Alaji Kante? I cannot remember uh, who else was at that meeting, but I know I was overruled, and so what I did, I drew the plans for both the airport and uh, State House at the same time. W were these written plans or just plans you had in your head no. and you discussed amongst yourself? No, they were all written down and well documented. Written. Do you have copies? Do you still have copies? It will be interesting. The night of the 21st, when uh, it fe the, the, the coup failed and we knew we were in deep trouble, I ran home and I burnt everything. You hid the evidence? I burnt it. You burnt the evidence. Yes, I did. Thank I burnt you. everything. Right. However, um, 
obviously I drew the plans. I knew exactly what to do. I had briefed the soldiers prior, prior to, to go into the airport. All of those soldiers within the Guard of Honor that we needed to, uh, in fact, the plan was that um, when the president goes between the Guard of Honor, but should, should I be saying this in public? Well, uh, I think... Uh, should I be saying some of these things in public? Yeah, I think... But that yes, but, but uh, the only exception is secure national security information. But uh, okay. I'm not sure whether this qualifies, but... Well, you know, you made a suggest well, uh, a decision uh, about 40 minutes ago not to go into the discussion of a certain thing because of the prevailing circumstances in the country. I also do not want to give ideas to somebody who might say, ah, well, it, this man said it, and then fair, so... Fair, fair enough, fair okay. enough. If you think it gives ideas to so, others so as what to, how to how to stage a coup, perhaps so, maybe yes. we, could, we, could, we could skip that. But uh, your idea was that at the airport, the president would be arrested. Yes, yes. And that, yeah, why yeah. didn't that happen? Okay, um, like I said, sorry, yes, uh, you're confirming. No. Please proceed. Like I said, um, I will skip the details of it, and I will be available for whatever details you want. Uh, no, please, elsewhere. by all means. Go ahead. But generally, it was for the airport. Um, but I can explain exactly what plans, how I uh, drew up the plans for State House. But that one failed. Now, the the plan. Why did it fail? Yes, I'm coming to that. Um, not not only had it leaked and that we were searched uh, before we went on parade. Uh, um, Jame was disarmed. Uh, Sana Sabali was supposed to bring ammunition to the airport because we, we didn't have any ammunition. And upon his arrival and distribution of the ammunition, which should have coincided with the plane parking at the, uh, at, on the apron, uh, then uh, we would have launched, but because we did not have the tools to implement, we could not. That is why it failed. But we received evidence that after the airport, soldiers went back to barracks. There was talk about it among the soldiers. Even the Nigerians were aware that a coup was in the making. Yes, that, like I said, it had leaked. In fact, uh, I was a member of the Color Party. Uh, the Color Party, those that uh, hold... W what the is Color Party yes, for those um, of us? Yes, uh, those that hold the national colors, the flags, the national colors, and the battalion colors. Okay, and, uh, you understand? Yes, I do. Yes. The, so, um, when we went to receive the colors from the, bata uh, from the battalion commander's office, there was Colonel Okoji uh, from Army Headquarters seated in the battalion commander's office along with Captain Biran Sen, who was in charge of military intelligence. So they are never there when we go to retrieve the colors from the battalion commander's office. Prior to that, I so think... So you suggesting, therefore, that they must have known something was happening. Of course they knew. I mean, we knew that they knew. Uh, in fact, um, prior to that, um, a couple of soldiers were arrested and taken to the then NSS, a defunct NIA. And uh, I cannot remember exactly who and who they were, but they were interrogated uh, on uh, what was happening in Yundum. So obviously it had leaked, it was rife, soldiers were talking about it in the camp. Yes. Just one last point before we go on our first break. Yes, We've sir. received testimony from a soldier who said he was there and he had Yaya Jame walked into Colonel Akoji's office. Uh, no, not Colonel Akoji, the commanding officer at Yundum Barracks at the time. Colonel Audu. Yes, and he told him that uh, everything has failed. And the guy told him, but the president is going home at State House. It's not true. It's not true. And I will tell you why. Yeah, Jamme was uh, was at the airport. 
Um, obviously, the president leaves before anybody leaves. When he came and inspected the guard of honor, he left. And so Jame could not at that time have been in Yundum barracks to tell Colonel Awudu uh, that it had failed. No, maybe, maybe I mischaracterized okay. it a bit, or maybe yes. I was misunderstood. Said after all the soldiers have left okay. Yundum barracks, sorry, the airport, mm -hmm. and returned to Yundum barracks, Yajame walked into this colonel's office and told him, well, everything has failed. And the Nigerian officer responded that, but it hasn't failed. This man, the president, is going home to state house. Not true. That is not true at all. First of all, you don't just walk into the battalion commander's office. Secondly, Yaya Jame and this particular uh, colonel, Colonel Audu, could, was, were like cat and mouse. They did not see eye to eye. Would you say? Yes that the Nigerian officers were aware that a coup was in the making and they just gave it a blind eye? No, I would not say that. Um, you see, in order uh, for you to take drastic measures, you need uh, strong enough evidence. I don't believe that they were talking enough to uh, Gambian soldiers or Gambian officers, there was that divide and also which brought a little bit of discontent. So we, we, we worked freely uh, under their nose, perhaps to their knowledge, but there was nothing that they could have done, at, well, sorry, they could have done something about it, but nothing was done because it was uh, perhaps it was just seen as a rumor. Uh, well, Nigeria is known to have had the most schools in West Africa. And uh, the Nigerian officers obviously are used to coup d'etats. We received evidence suggesting that these Nigerian officers, in fact, encouraged the Gambian officers to stage a coup d'etat. That is not true. I was one of the, those from, uh, that started this. There was no encouragement from, Niger from any Nigerian officer or soldier uh, at Yundum at the time, or in Farafene or anywhere. But did they give a blind eye to what was <coughs> obvious in the camp at the time? No, I don't believe that they gave a blind eye. Thank you very much. This is a good point to stop, and uh, we come back after uh, the time the Chair would uh, direct. <coughs> Thank you, Lead Council. Thank you, Witness. We come back at uh, five minutes after twelve. Is that okay? That's fine. Okay. Thank you.